the 91st Training Division Museum, U.S. Army Reserve, and the World War II Jeep. Our cadet Kevin Bratzlack, Dayton Roland Hall, Eric and Sean Biber. Marine Corps League, Santa Rosa Detachment, number 686. Commander Steve Bouchard, Rob Jackson, Rich Robbins, the League Assist All Marines, former Marines, as well as their widows and children. Runs for Tory and Cox and holds sacred the memory of those Marines and FMF Corps members who have given their lives to the nation. Semper Fidelis, always faithful. Welcome everybody, thank you for coming. You may know that the uh, Pelham Museum is hosting an exhibit called Korea, the Forgotten War, and we're very honored uh, to recognize those veterans. With World War II and right after then Vietnam, somehow Korea gets unfortunately missed, and, and their, their contributions were very significant, so, so we're very honored to be able to recognize them. And today we, we have four heroes of the sky, and we're honored that they decided to uh, come here and share their stories with us, and, and I'd like to return the favor to Leon. I mean, this, none of this would be possible without him, so I'm going to let him uh, introduce these gentlemen, and thank you for coming. I felt it was very appropriate when you have a gathering like this. Gentlemen, you may sit down. Thank you. Uh, that we reflect on the, the past, but also the, the, the current and, and the current men and women that are on the front lines of freedom. And you know, 
we have a, a local man who's from Petaluma here, and he represents the uh, 230 Breath Engineering Company, and his name is Captain Jose Dominguez, and he has a few words to speak about their mission and the opportunity to be here with all of you veterans and residents from Sonoma County. And I'd like to introduce Captain Dominguez. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Captain Jose Dominguez uh, of the California Army National Guard, and I have the distinct honor and privilege to command the sappers of the 235th Engineer Company um, that are currently stationed here in this great city of Petaluma. Um, the combat engineers of the 235th have been very busy over the past decade supporting global war on terrorism in various uh, state and federal missions. Um, immediately following the attack September 11, 2001, Alpha Company of the 579th Engineer Battalion, which uh, was the previous destination of the 235th before it was redesignated. Um, they uh, sent out a, uh, some, they immediately responded to our nation's call and um, sent the company to uh, Operation Aerospace, which actually provided security operations for commercial, um, uh, commercial airports, excuse me. Um, in 2003, soldiers were deployed to uh, Dugway Proving Grounds, Utah, in support of Operation Noble Eagle, which mobilized thousands of National Guards and reserve personnel to perform security missions um, and in military installations and other potential threats such as bridges, power plants, and port facilities. Following Operation Noble Eagle, um, in J January 2004, Alpha Company was mobilized to provide support um, engineering support to the 81st Armored Brigade as part of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Subsequently, in January 2008, now the 235th, as we are now called, once again answered our nation's call and mobilized as a route clearance company in support of Operation During Freedom to provide freedom of maneuver uh, to coalition Afghan forces in the province of East Paktika by ways of depriving the enemy forces from the infamous IEDs. Now on the eve of 2013, the 235th is in preparation and constantly currently training in its wartime function to redeploy in support of Operation Enduring Freedom, which we, are, we, as, which, as we as combat engineers sappers will hunt IEDs in order to enable safe passage for our brothers in arms. Regardless of how busy the 235th has been over the past decade, there is one terrible truth. In this profession of arms, without sacrifice, professional and courage, the war is before us set the conditions to inherit a great nation that we have, that we as soldiers can now serve in this uh, great community and nation. So in, in, uh, in short, you know, your uh, Petaluma has a great National Guard armory with great heritage and uh, honors of the uh, engineers here. So again, without you gentlemen, setting, forth, uh, setting, us, uh, setting the path for us to actually follow in your footsteps, uh, we couldn't be here without that. So thank you very much for, uh, for everything you've done and you too in the audience, thank you. That's a great patriot right there who's on the front lines of freedom and he's an exemplar of a generation that is dedicated and it's unfortunate a lot of Americans are at the mall and we have fine young men and women like that and we really need to thank them for their service. So. When this is over, when you see these young guys, walk up to them and shake their hand and thank them. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce another uh, speaker, a blue suitor, and it was very appropriate there since all these gentlemen here are retired U.S. Air Force, and he's got a smile on his face over there. He's pretty excited about this opportunity. His name is Tech Sergeant Ramon Lopez, U.S. Air Force, and he's with the 645th Aircraft Maintenance Squadron from Travis Air Force Base. Good afternoon, everybody. I, as he said, I'm uh, Tech Sergeant Lopez, and I'm from Travis Air Force Base here in uh, Fairfield. I'd just like to give a brief synopsis of what I've done, uh, where I've been, and it starts with uh, going to Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. Then I went on to Shepard to learn how to be an aircraft maintenance technician to fix the one of our airplanes these gentlemen have flown. My first duty station was uh, Charleston, South Carolina, working on C-17s. 
that on, Antu rode a naval station in Spain working on C-5s and C-17s. And now I also got stationed at Kirtland Air Force Base, New Mexico, uh, working on CB-22s. I'm now a, a reservist and a full-time civilian here at uh, Travis Air Force Base, and I still work on C-17s. And I'm in so many places uh, due to the fact that I'm a flying crew chief. So I'm a flying mechanic when I go uh, around the world with these uh, wonderful C-17 airplanes. Just a young spe uh, little speech I prepared. When I was a young boy, I did not know the difference between military branches. I was just aware that we, the United States, went to win those wars. I remember watching Operation Desert Storm and Kosovo footage on television, reacting to it as if it were not real, something that is out of the norm. You just see, see it on TV. Maybe it was a movie to me. My parents, being immigrants from Mexico, were not able to serve in this great country, in this military. But my older brother went into the army. He was an infantryman for three years. And when he came home and showed me his nice press uniforms and his shiny boots and his jungle boots, I wanted to be like him. I wanted to serve in our, our country. I was lucky enough for my wife's grandpa to, to have uh, served in the army. I met him and he was in World War II, served in the Pacific as a combat engineer. Before then, I had not met anybody who had been, been to war and seen combat. I was very intrigued by some of his stories, and he always mentioned, we're all brothers, we're all brothers. No matter what part of the country you were from, at that point in time, you were all brothers and sisters. And I, I always took that to heart, and I always remembered his saying, we're all brothers. Well, here in, all the, in this room, whether you served or your husband or wife served as my wife, she did not serve, but she was still brother and sister to everybody here in this room, because we're all veterans. Uh, having him in my life was, was awesome. All those stories he shared, all, I'm sure all, the, all these young men have stories that, that they can tell everybody. Um, it, it puts things into perspective from when he served to when I served. He said they had obviously no cell phones, they had no email, no video games like we have now. They just resorted to playing cards and just being brothers and enjoying the time. Enjoying because, uh, yes, it was a time of war and they had to do what they had to do. After September 11th, I started to realize how much our service members gave to our country. And I want to express to you how important your sacrifices have been to me personally and to our country. To me, a veteran is a hero. To me, a veteran is a person who sees the big picture, which is freedom for our country. To me, a veteran is one who laid the foundation for me and future generations of airmen, soldiers, sailors, Coast Guardsmen, and Marines. To me, a veteran is one who never forgets what it's like to proudly serve for the United States of America. Many of you have been to war. Many of you have been to foreign countries where you were not even able to point it out on the map before or after you left. I know I have. Many of you have been to places which, wasn't, which if it wasn't for the military, we would never have been there. I know I did. Many of you have, not been, have been away from your friends and family at a moment's notice. I know I was. Many of you will not hesitate to do it all over again. I know I won't. At this time, I'd like to thank my wife uh, because she has been, along with everybody else's spouse, been putting up with numerous, numerous things over the past 10 years that I've been lucky enough to serve our country. A short story, I went to Iraq on a three-day notice right after New Year's, and she had no choice. She had to hold it down uh, while I was away. But now, being a grown man, I know what it is to each, and, to each of their family members, what they've gone through and what their family has gone through. I am proud to continue, continue serving with my brothers and sisters for what you have done for the red, white, and blue, and for what you continue to do. I salute you. Well done. I would imagine this panel knows a little bit about being deployed and what it's like to be away from your family for a, a long period of time. And, you know, again, you know, a lot of Americans are at the mall, and people seem to forget the sacrifices of what these people do for us. You know, we have our bright todays and tomorrows, and they're out there on the front lines of freedom. And it's young men like him who have followed the footsteps of these valiant men up here on this panel, what makes this country what it is today. And it's commitment, it's duty, it's resolution, and it's focus, 
and it's mission success. And that's why America is this great nation. And you're following those footsteps, young man. Well said. Okay, so uh, we're going to move on here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the era war in Korea. And I'm going to regress just a little bit. You know, look around this building here. You know, and what's this mean? You know, you, you look at that bar in there and you see those pictures of all these veterans and you see these gentlemen in the, in the wheelchair, you know. And I think it's important that, you know, on a day like this, we need to all look back on what this means and the sacrifice that's been put forth by so many of our fellow Americans, people before us, young men like him on the, on the front lines of freedom. And this is a day of commemoration. It's a day of remembering. It's a day of respect. And, you know, I, I saw those warbirds flying over. I mean, this was part of their, their generation. And it's real relevant that we all must teach our young people that are coming up now in the schools about our history and the people, that, their predecessors, and what they did to make this country what it is today. And that's really what happened in Korea. They call it the Forgotten War. And I'll give you a little bit of a quick timeline here. In August of 1945, we dropped the atomic bomb. World War II ends, and the boys are coming home. The war to end all wars. Well, unfortunately, that's probably never going to happen. And in turn, what happens? In 1946, Winston Churchill delivers that inspirational speech about we have a new enemy, and the Iron Curtain is cast upon from the Baltic all the way down into the Caucasus. And we went from fighting National Socialism to fighting the Soviets, Socialism. In 1948, we had the Berlin Airlift. They isolated our troops in Berlin. What did we do? Air power paved the way. And we showed them that America's resolved. We showed them what air power can do and what the Air Force can do. And they couldn't stop it. And Stalin kept hedging and hedging and hedging, and he was back and forth with Mao Zedong. Communists had taken over China. And we were all worried about Eastern Europe. We were worried about a great battle on the plains of uh, Germany, mass waves of Soviet tanks. But where did the war start? In one of the armpits of the world, Korea. And where, where are all of our boys? They're all home. What did we have to fight with? A bunch of old World War II weapons, old airplanes that were sitting on Johnson Air Base, P-51s, F-82s like Colonel Kraut flew. They were on the front lines then, and these men were there. But this was a pivotal time in aviation because this was the difference between props to jets. And it was still a war where it was a man flying the machine, a man with great vision, and a man with courage to go in there and, and make it happen. But it was a, a great transition in aviation. And what these men did flying props, for instance, Mr. Brooks here, and what he learned shooting down Germans completely changed a lot when they got into Korea. But getting back to the, the Forgotten War, America was asleep at the wheel. And we took a hell of a licking. And when the war was over, people didn't want to go back and think about it. They didn't want to remember it. And unfortunately, Korea was just kind of pushed aside. And everything that we learned there, politically, geographically, and with our, our military, we kind of forgot. And what happened later? Well, we had a, another conflict called Southeast Asia, and we're not going to go there with that. But the Forgotten War, and it really truly was. And these gentlemen here are going to tell you a little bit about the war. And I can tell you right now, it's not forgotten with them. Because they, they, they were there, they lost friends, blood was shed, and it was a deadly duel. And you know, when you're up in the sky and you're up there at 40,000 feet, there's no aid stations. There's no, there's no medic who's going to come rescue you. You're fighting the elements. You're fighting against a, a superior aircraft in certain ways, the MiG-15. But we met the challenge and these men were there. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Major General Norman DeBach. Norman's an old friend of mine, but I have a friend who'd like to say thank you and this goes back to when you were at Hamilton Field. Stuart. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming today after the parade. I know it was a wonderful experience. 
I was on the other side of town buying some batteries for this microphone and I saw the planes from a distance. It was quite a sight. Um, General DeBach, I was a student at Terrell Linda High School. I grew up in Marin County. Uh, and I, growing up, I heard the jets uh, tuning their engines at night when I was a little boy. And that sound, as it whispered over the hills, was like dragons in the mist. It uh, was enigmatic to me. Uh, I looked forward someday to become a fighter pilot. Uh, I studied for my ground school exam and passed second in my class. I think it's the proudest achievement of my life. Uh, and we flew the flight from Noss Field to Ukiah and to Sacramento Executive and back. Uh, but it was the end of the Vietnam War, uh, and they did not need as many pilots as they did in 68 or 66. And so I didn't have the opportunity to fly. But it is a great honor and a privilege to meet you four gentlemen, and I thank you very much for coming this long distance to see us today. Thank you very much. Does everybody have a, a program in their hands? These biographies are very extensive, and we had to modify and, and some of them quite a bit. And it's your curriculum vitae. But I'll give you a, a quick overview uh, with General DeBach. He grew up in Danville, and that was pretty much a cow town back then. He, t he told me many years ago, you know, Leon, he goes, my inspiration from flight was when I was riding my horse bareback. And all of a sudden, I saw this biplane come over. I was just a little boy, and I was riding this horse, and this airplane landed in front of me. He said, I thought that was the most marvelous thing I'd ever saw, and I rode my horse over there. I got up close to that airplane, but lo and behold, that little boy who rode that horse up to that airplane would retire a major general in the U.S. Air Force with a command pilot with over 20,000 flying hours. And he served in Korea in 1955, and he's going to tell you about his experiences. And he's a dear friend of mine, and he's been very supportive of my work with an airman story, as have the rest of these men. Fine man. General LeBach, sir. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you very much for the kind words. I want to thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for coming today to honor the military people who have served. And by military people, I mean men and women. I also include children who have served. They have served because they've been home while their parents are away fighting in a war or just serving overseas. It's hard on them, I know. I had three kids, and we talk about it even today, that uh, we uh, missed a lot of uh, Christmases and Thanksgivings and uh, holidays when we made them. So thank you for coming to support the military people. Today, instead of talking about my one year active duty as a fighter pilot flying 86s in Korea chasing MiGs, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the personal training experiences along the way, just a short 57 years ago. At that time, I was 22, 23 years old, and so the words that I put down here are from the mind of a 20, 22-year-old. Not all fighter pilots enter fighter pilot training in the 86 at that time after you complete pilot training. It's about the top 10%. I was assigned to the 96th Squadron, commanded by AA's Major Boots Busse at Nellis Air Force Base. My instructor was a lieutenant by the name of Paul Cato. Boots had shot down 12 MiGs in the Korean War. Paul had shot down two. So our training was, could not have been better. Uh, by the way, Boots just passed away last week at the age of 91. The training was about 40 hours in the F-86, and after graduating from Nellis, I was assigned to go to Korea to the 311th TAC Fighter Squadron, K-55, uh, Osan, Korea, for one year. I want to interject a comment about going through a school like Nellis. There's a lot of schools that we have all gone through, and a real smart person, when they go through that school, when you graduate, if they don't know your name, you have done a good job. 
you to slide in, do the school, and slide out. Unfortunately, I wasn't a smart pilot. I had five events going through Nellis. And I'm not proud of them, I'm just gonna talk about them. They are things that happened. At that time in the military, ping pong was a very big thing. When I was in college, I'd been the ear mural ping pong champion so I could play ping pong. Boost Blasse was the ping pong champion at Nellis Air Force Base till I beat him 99 games in a row. That did not set me well with anybody. Uh, I should have lost, but I wasn't smart enough. Secondly, I played on a basketball team that won a championship. He didn't like that either. Thirdly, uh, I was on a gunnery mission in an airplane numbered 24587. I had flew it and had a good score and I was happy with what I'd done. So in the afternoon, I was scheduled to fly again. And I looked at this scoring sheet and that airplane was going but wasn't assigned to me. So I asked the scheduler, can I fly 24987? And they said, no, we don't change airplanes. To make a long story short, we went out to the gunnery range and there's two things pilots do, I'm gonna tell you right now. One is they slur their words, and the other is they talk with their hands. Well, we got out to the gunnery range, and I was number three in a different aircraft, and Boots went in as number one on the target. Number two was on base, two turned in. I was on downwind, turned base. Two pulled up, I rolled in on final, and as two pulled up, and we're going about 450 knots, which is very close to 500 miles an hour. He pulled up and both wings came off and he flew into the ground at 500 miles an hour. So I pulled up and made a missed approach and uh, we went back to the base and I never asked the Air Force again to change aircraft with me. Uh, that was about it, but there was one good thing that did happen to me when I was in Dallas. My roommate was from Philadelphia, and he said, Norm, he says, uh, my cousin's from Philly's come on, on over. I need a date for her. She's gonna be at the Thunderbird, and would you please take her out? And I looked at him, and he wasn't handsome like these guys. And so I figured, well, she probably wouldn't be too pretty, so I was busy. And he says, oh, come on. I said, check with everybody else in the squadron. He checked with everybody and came back in about two minutes and said, nobody can make it, but if you take her out to dinner, I'll buy you dinner at the Thunderbird. Well, at that time, dinner at the Thunderbird in Las Vegas was $1. <laughs> so long story short, I did pick her up. She was very pretty. We did have a nice time. In fact, I offered to go water skiing with her the next day. She went. I uh, finished Nellis a week later and went to Korea. She went back to uh, Hollywood did quite well in the movies. Her name was Grace Kelly. <laughs> Additional schools along the way. Uh, when you check out in the F-86, they don't just give you the key and you turn the key and then go. Things happen. Uh, one of them, a lot of people were jumping out of the airplane and they were landing in water and they did not know how to disengage themselves from the parachute and the harness, and so they wound up grounding. They finally sent all fighter pilots to a school, at least the one I went to was in Oklahoma, where they would actually parasail you up to 500 feet. You'd release the parachute, go down in the water, and they taught you how to get out of it. And they dragged you behind a boat 40 miles an hour. And if you didn't drown, they waved the flag and you could disengage, but you did learn how to get out of a parachute. S secondly, another thing we had to do was go to survival school. Uh, the survival school, that's if you get shot down in enemy territory to know something about how to take care of yourself. Well, I grew up in the country, so a large part of survival school was very easy for me. The hard part was we were questioned and given some answers to give, and of course nobody gave them. So they put everybody, and there were 24 of us in the class, they put everybody in a box. 
in a box was smaller than the size of a refrigerator. They would leave you there, in my case, for four hours. At the end of four hours, you heard the two uh, people that were guards, both big gentlemen wearing Russian uniforms, playing Russian music, get in a Jeep and drive off to lunch. And they had a cigarette in a dish, and the dish fell into the waste paper basket, and it caught fire. So here you are, locked in a box, you smell the smoke, and you hear everybody driving away. I mean to tell you that does upset you a little bit. They, they came back a half hour later and let us all out, but uh, it was something I would like to forget right away, but you never do forget it. In fact, it still has, uh, today it has results that I cannot sleep in a bed with the sheets tucked in. Okay. Okay, the thing I would really like to talk to you about is, well, when we were in Korea, uh, you do your flying and you're looking for MiGs, and that was there right after the war was over, but that didn't mean the MiGs didn't come south, not very far, and that doesn't mean we didn't go north. We did. One of the things you had to be very careful for is a F-86 only carries at most an hour 45 worth of gas. At the end of hour 45, you're going to be on the ground somewhere. It was not capable of air-to-air -air refueling, so you always kept looking at the fuel gauge and you kept knowing where, where home is. And when it was time to go home, you'd call the radar controller, approach controller, and say, give me a vector back to the base. But you had to be very careful because in Korea, the North Koreans had radar controllers with better radios than Americans had and controllers that spoke better English than our controllers. So they would get a hold of you and they would tell you to turn in directions where you'd wind up over North Korea or over Russia. And so that was one of the things you, you had to be aware of. The last thing that I would like to tell you about is probably a story that uh, I think is quite funny. We were 12 people that were invited, told to go to uh, Formosa. At that time it was called uh, Taiwan. China was getting uh, uppity with Taiwan and Taiwan was afraid of an invasion. So I was in one of the first group of 12 airplanes that flew down from from Osan, we went to Fukuoka, Japan, and then the first night we stopped at Kadena Air Base in Okinawa. We were a motley looking group of pilots. I don't think anybody too had the same looking flight suit. The war had just been over and they didn't have replacement of new flight suits. Uh, quite frankly, we looked like hell. So we uh, parked the airplanes, go over to a POQ for the night, a bus picks us up and takes us down to the officer's club for dinner. We all get out and our squadron commander, and why I remember his name, I don't, but uh, it was, excuse me, Edmund D. Griffin. So Colonel Griffin uh, is our Boy Scout leader and there's uh, 14 of us. And we get off the bus to walk in the club and a major comes running out, spiffy and beautiful uniform, and he says, Certainly you're not thinking of going into this club to looking like that. And the colonel says, yeah, we're, we're worker bees. We flew down from Korea and they're all hungry. And he says, I wouldn't let you in this club looking like that. So we're just kind of sitting there looking like, what do we do next? And he says, I'm offering to take you, get a bus and take you down to the flight line. We have some very nice vending machines, and we will be able to feed you dinner out of the vending machine. So uh, they call the bus, and the bus is coming down. While we're waiting for the bus, all of a sudden, the highest hill in Okinawa, which is probably 100 feet, a car comes racing, racing down the hill. But I forgot to say one thing before that. At the end, before we could go, 
one of the newbies in the squadron, a newbie is a brand new pilot, asked the uh, Colonel Griffin, can I call my wife? And Griffin said, sure. So in those days, credit cards didn't work. You couldn't call collect, you had to have money. So we all chipped in quarters. He called his wife, talked to her for about a minute and hung up. And then we saw the car come racing down the hill about 10 minutes later while we were waiting for the bus. And there's a red light going on top and we thought, boy, there's been an explosion on the base or an airplane crashed. And we watched the car and it went around and around and finally came up to where we were, slammed on the brakes and skidded to a stop. The general got out of the car and dressed in a perfectly impeccable uniform, looked us all over, saw the oldest guy and knew that was the squadron commander, raced over to him and saluted him and said, welcome to Kadena Air Force Base, please be my guest tonight at, the, at our officers club. And we're all looking around, you know, what's happening, but he says, may I recommend that you have the sirloin, sirloin steak and, with lobster and we will you will be our guest. So Colonel Griffin goes over to the lieutenant and says, who did you call? He says, well, I called my wife. And who did your wife perhaps call? Well, she probably called her father. <laughs> and what does her father do? Oh, he's the secretary of the Air Force. True story. So the next day we head down to uh, Tainan, Taiwan, 15 airplanes. One last story and I'll shut up. Uh, we're intercepting any stray aircraft that come across the Taiwan Strait, which is the bay between uh, Taiwan and, and China. And it averages between 50 and 60 miles wide. And uh, about the second week we were there, uh, all our planes on alert had been scheduled, had gone off and chasing aircraft in the sky. And I was there with a, another pilot and all of a sudden they spotted a MiG. And uh, they looked for someone to go and I was one person chosen and so another guy was chosen, the two of us uh, took off to go intercept the MiG. I was element lead, and element lead in the Air Force is when you can lead one airplane, and a flight lead is when you can lead uh, three, you being the fourth. We had two airplanes, and uh, we went out, and the radar put me in a position where I was able to get behind the MiG, and uh, I called, the rules of engagement are, if you're not attacked, you have to get permission to fire. So I called the controller and said, I have a, target in sight, request permission to fire. Well, he didn't know what to say. He didn't want to give it to me. He said, I got to check with my boss. So I, I followed him and 30 seconds later, his boss gets on, asks the same questions and I answered him and he says, I can't give you permission. Let, I'll get right back to you. So finally, uh, General Cuter, who was the commander of Far East Air Force at that time, gets on the radio and he calls me and I use my old call sign, Cowboy. He says, uh, Cowboy lead, I understand that you have a, uh, had a Megan sight. Do you still have him in sight? Yes, sir. Uh, do you, could you tell me at this time, perhaps the distance between you and the Meg? I would say approximately 30 feet without batting a moment, he says, what's your position? And I said to myself, how the hell do I know my position? I've been chasing this airplane all over the sky. I don't even know where I am. But I did look at the TACAN, which is a navigation instrument on the airplane. And it said I was on the 268 degree radial of Taipei TACAN at 74 miles. And he said, permission to fire, not granted, return to base. And I said, yes, sir, permission to fire, not granted, we, uh, we're returning. 
And he could tell by my, my, my voice that I was not very happy. I wanted to shoot this guy down. I've been trained to do it for two years. And he, so he said, the reason you weren't given permission to shoot is you currently are 25 miles over China, and it would not do well to shoot an airplane down and have it crash in China. That is the end of my talk of flying F-86s. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Norm. It's, it's not over here now. We have an opportunity, and we have the time to do it for a Q&A. So I, I encourage you to step forth. If you have questions, there's something that, that struck you about that story, um, I mean, I can pass the mic to you. Hell, I'll jump down there, and, and Ed Deardorff says, you're too old to do that. I said, no, I can still do that. Let them use the... So were any of your um, colleagues uh, in that exercise where we took the Chinese nationalists off the offshore islands? You may recall that repeat, China... Please. Hello? Re repeat, please. Uh, shortly after the time you were down there, the um, Chinese nationalists tried to retake the offshore islands, or uh, the Chinese communists tr tried to retake the offshore islands, and they were succeeding. Uh, and we we put a, a task force down, a couple of um, task force 58 down there, uh, and gave cover for the nationalists to come out. Were any of your colleagues there? Uh, nobody got shot down, and uh, they were there. Uh, we just did our job. Uh, we saw Megs, but nobody shot a Meg down, and we didn't shoot a Meg. They ran a very, very tight base, and in fact, it was so tight that we were told, do not go to your airplane at night. And what the Chinese had is a little triangle, and they when anybody, a mechanic or a guard, went on the flight line where the airplanes were, they would play a song on the triangle. And if the song was not the right song of the day, you'd hear burp, and they just killed them. You know, well, one of the reasons I asked is that I was on an escort vessel uh, during that evacuation program, and uh, one of the things we got to do was to pull uh, American aviators out of the drink when their aircraft ran out of fuel. And uh, uh, we had one guest on board. And I was wondering whether it was one of your comrades. I didn't hear enough. Uh... What would you well, like me to do? We're awful loud. Speak slower, a little louder, please. This better? the destroyers that picked up downed pilots. And uh, during that evacuation, um, one of our pilots, I think he ran out of fuel, and so we had him as a guest on board our destroyer escort. And I was wondering if it was any of your colleagues. Apparently it was not. Well, thank you very much. So uh, we uh, didn't lose any pilots there. And we had uh, one bailout, but uh, he was recovered. Any other uh, questions? Please step up. Thank you. Thank you, Norm. I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Colonel John. Lowry, U.S. Air Force, retired. And I want to regress a little bit here about fighter pilots. And again, in this era, it was still the man, not the machine, who ruled the skies. It was your ability, your physical prowess, your courage, and your eyesight. And in Korea, it was a gun war. 
we were using the 50 cal and they were using the 23 millimeter and 37 millimeter cannon. But there's one thing about fighter pilots that, that through the years I've, I've learned and I've interviewed so many of them and some are here in this room, some of their family are in this room right here. And it was the, the tenacity and the interest to, to win, to press, press on to victory, press on. And there's one thing about a lot of those guys through the years, and General Joe Foss, who Jim knows very well, and a lot of the other guys, Hub Zemke, and you know, they were all hunters. Colonel Moorhead, I used to go hunting and fishing with Colonel Moorhead. He, he passed away here some months ago, 95 years old, and we'd go squirrel hunting, and he would outshoot me. So, you know. Um, but it was the ability with, with firearms and the ability to hunt and to shoot. And I was talking with John the other night, and John still shoots all the time. And you, know, you put those two together from a, a man in his uh, era and generation, fighter pilot with guns. Well, you know, there's a whole other story that in Southeast Asia, we won't go there, and they didn't have the gun. But he was part of that generation, and you know, he still shoots to this day. And I really thought that was kind of poignant when we were talking, because I was listening very intently on you know, what he did in Korea uh, subsequent to that, and all through the years, you know, he was a duck hunter. He, he hunted uh, ducks, geese, pheasants, deer, antelope. Uh, he's a taxidermist, but he still shoots. So that's the kind of guy that you want up in the sky going after the bad guys. And um, getting into his biography very briefly here, uh, he flew with the 4th Fighter Interceptor Wing, 334th Fighter Interceptor Squadron, and he flew with, at a particular time in Korea where there was a, a lot of the famous MIG, excuse me, uh, saber aces. And he'll tell you about that. And also he's an author of five books. He's been a consultant to the History Channel, the Military Channel. And uh, I'm looking forward to going to hunting with him here pretty soon. We're going to shoot a few birds. May I present uh, Colonel John Lowry. Is my mic hot now? It is? Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> when you hear my talk, keep in mind that <clears throat> when I w I've got this. When, uh, when I went to Korea, I was uh, 23 years old and fresh out of Auburn, Auburn uh, Alabama, population 3,500 when class was not in session. Uh, but 6,000 when it was in session. Most people know it now as Auburn University. Uh, but I was very impressed with everything. And having survived the uh, training at Nellis, I was, to say the least, hot to trot to get into combat before the uh, war ended. And as a result, I checked in two, uh, one day early and because I checked in early, I went between Easy Class and Fox Class and wound up getting my choice of assignments, which I said, I want to go to where Major Jabera is, which is how I got to the 334th Squadron. Uh, <clears throat> this is the first thing I saw. It was 8 o'clock in the morning, the 20, 21st of January, 1953, and it was extremely cold for an Alabama boy. And uh, it was like walking in into a movie set. The, uh, there was a tent city. The streets were gravel. The sidewalks, thanks to the Army Corps of Engineers, the sidewalks were, for, were plank, board plank. And uh, many of the operations buildings were rehabilitated Japanese because Kempo had been a Japanese fighter base during World War II. But it was also the shortest runway for fighters in, uh, in the theater. It was 6,000 feet long, which is pretty short for a uh, jet fighter. Okay. <clears throat> this is our operations, 334th Squadron operations. And uh, it was a rehabilitated building. Okay. And these are the squadron maintenance buildings. Every squadron had its own integral maintenance at that time. Okay, and the next one. See, this was a lounge we built. It's covered with a tent, as you can see. 
but it's built of the uh, teak wood uh, packing crates that the drop tanks were shipped in from Japan. Teak wood. <laughs> okay, next one. And this is the BOQ area. These were rehabilitated uh, buildings from the Japanese era. Okay. And this was an anti-aircraft uh, installment right outside of the BOQ area. And uh, believe me, it'll keep you awake in the middle of the night when Bed Shack Charlie comes over. Uh, first time I heard it, the hair stood straight up on my end, up on end, and I jumped off the cot and came running out. It was midnight. Everybody else said, "Go back to bed. It's just Bed Shack Charlie." A little bi-wing airplane that would fly over and they'd drop mortars out. Okay, okay. Uh, this was the officer's open mess, and for some reason they called it Swig Alley. Uh, I know there was some, some drinking of adult beverages, but I don't know why it got the name of Swig Alley. Okay. And um, this is the uh, alert area. Uh, we had uh, 12 aircraft on strip alert. We had a 30 minute uh, alert, five minute alert, and three minute alert. The three minute alert sat in the airplanes. Next one. And here are the airplanes sitting alert. Now, go ahead and. Uh, oh, by the way, well, never mind. Yeah, the, the mountain, the mountain in the background was called Witch's Tit Mountain. And that was a, a major checkpoint when you were coming into the traffic pattern. Okay. This is the squadron maintenance area, and you can see the revetments where we kept the airplanes. And my hat is still off to the NCOs that did the maintenance on the airplanes, open bay maintenance in 10 degree below zero weather. That's tough work. Okay, next one. This is our squadron commander, Colonel Ayersman. And this is uh, Bill Lilly, who was the operations officer, and he was an ace with seven kills. And this is Major Kerstetter from Group Ops. Uh, this is one of our flight commanders who had just gotten a kill, and typical of fighter pilots, he was describing the engagement to uh, his fellow uh, pilots. Okay. And this is the... Uh, 335th Squadron airplane landing. Okay. And this is uh, a Royal Australian Air Force Gloucester Meteor. And they had a squadron of uh, Australian Air Force uh, pilots and airplanes on the field, but we were not allowed to go to their operations. And the reason for it was when we parted with the Australians, there were too many broken arms, broken legs, and broken teeth from the games they played. So we were not allowed to go near their operations. Okay. This is Ralph Parr. Uh, Ralph Parr was what I call a modern day gladiator. He, he looked for and relished a fight. And, uh, it wasn't his fifth kill, I can't remember which one it was, but he was telling me about it. Here I am, a brand new first lieutenant, and uh, he's a senior captain. And he says, John, you know, we were canopy to canopy, and I could see his feet on the rudder bars. And he said, I'm sure he could see mine. He said, he had a red beard, which meant he was a Russian. And of course, we, we learned later that the guys that were really good with the airplane were Russians, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But uh, I'll go ahead in the next one. This is Ralph's fifth kill, and uh, it, it too was a Russian, and he literally sawed the wing off of it with the 50 caliber machine guns, but it was a, a swirling, high-G dogfight. And um, he seemed to be adept at finding the, the MiGs at low altitude. All of my engagements except one were at very high altitude, 47, 48, 49,000 feet. And so because you're very close to stall, 
if you, if you turn and pull any G's, uh, you have to, it's like balancing on a tightrope at high altitude. And so you never made more than 15 degrees bank uh, at high altitude. But we were trying to get them because they could go higher than we could. Okay, next one. This is one, this is Pete Fernandez. And he had just gotten his ninth and tenth kill. And uh, I was standing with Major Jubera, the first jet ace. <clears throat> I was standing with him in squadron operations, listening to the radio. And, and Captain Fernandez transmits, uh, he says, the Mexican got two, meaning he had made double A's. Uh, he wasn't really Mexican, he was Spanish. His, his parents came from Spain. But anyway, he called himself the Mexican got two. There's his airplane in the background being disarmed, dearmed, and cleaned. <clears throat> okay, next one. Now, I put this one on there because I talked about uh, what a what a great uh, combat tour it was. I've often said that air-to-air -air combat, the F-86 versus the MiG, was the greatest shooting sport that I ever participated in. To, to uh, take a phrase from English literature, it was the most dangerous game. And uh, that's not to say I didn't breathe heavily at times, but uh, it was the most dangerous game. But it was also uh, very deadly if you got caught, if you got captured. Now, this is my roommate, uh, Bob Neiman, First Lieutenant Robert F. Neiman. He was a brand new graduate of uh, West Point Flight School, and he was a class ahead of me in flying school. He was an E class, I was an F class. And he is on the Jeep going out to the alert area to pick up his airplane to fly what turned out to be his last mission. And what happened was they were in a hard turn left chasing two MiGs and one got behind him and he saw the, the gunfire and broke and the MiG, there was another one he didn't see that shot him down. <clears throat> Truthfully, we didn't know what happened to him. We just knew that he didn't come home because nobody saw him get hit or crash. <clears throat> but 41 years later, the Russian wing commander of the MiG fighter wing at Antung, China, and his, his chief of intelligence from that fighter wing, both told a, a, a San Francisco Chronicle reporter that, you know, I remember a Lieutenant Nyman or Neiman, and said, uh, we visited him in a Chinese military hospital in Antung, he had been wounded in the left leg during when he was shot down. And he said not only would he refuse to be interviewed, but he, he chastised me, the wing commander, for violating international law for trying to interrogate a wounded POW. Okay? And he never did. He, the, the general said, Loboff, General Loboff said that Neiman never would talk. He never would be interview, uh, interrogated. And so they gave him to the GRU, which I believe was the predecessor of the NKGB, and they took him to Khabarovsk, Siberia, which was just across the border with China, for further intelligence debriefing. And then there was a little note on some Russian documents that we were given. I have a copy of it. It says he died. And you can only imagine how he died, but that statement could be false because they took, we think, 30 F-86 pilots to Moscow for intelligence debriefing. And because Bob was a very intelligent gentleman and had refused to talk, I don't know, I have no idea whether they broke him or not, but uh, they never repatriated him, even though he and 29 others are known to have been alive on the ground and, and captured. Okay? And uh, by the way, Russian President Boris Yeltsin in 1991 told 
I can't remember who all, but Congressman Dornan was one of them because Dornan told me, by the way, Dornan had been one of my students in F-86 combat crew training and, uh, and then later became a, a congressman. But he says that Pre President Ye Yeltsin told him personally that they had American POWs in, in, uh, in Russia. And if I may, I've just finished writing a book, which will be out soon. But uh, in the chapter on the unreturned POWs, I discovered recently declassified information that showed that when we left Vietnam on Operation Homecoming, we knowingly left 705 airmen, my comp compatriots, in North Vietnam and 300 known POWs in Laos, and they wanted $4 billion repatriation money to repatriate them. And the president turned it down. Okay. That's a different story. Okay, next one, please, sir. Now, this, this occurred on the 21st of September, 1953. And uh, I was in watching, looking at gun camera film when somebody started running down the hall of the intelligence building saying, a MiG just landed, a MiG just landed. And a bunch of us ran out and got in the squadron vehicle and went roaring down to the end of the runway to the alert area. And there sat this beautiful silver North Vietnamese MiG. Magnificent airplane, even though it was inferior in performance to the F-86. And, uh, and there it sat. And, and coincidentally, I made a picture of it uh, from a long distance, but a couple of the guys, as you can see here, made photographs of it from, from close up and hid their camera. And I later developed the, the film in the, photo, in the photo lab and gave everybody a copy and almost got an Article 15 for it. <laughs> But that's, that's how a few pictures survived. But everybody that took color photos of it had their film confiscated when they mailed it to Hawaii to be developed, okay? But uh, when, the, when the MiG landed, us guys, the pilots, were not allowed to see him, talk to him through an interpreter, or look at the airplane. It was hauled off and covered up and, you know, intelligence took over. And then it was, it was flown out on a, uh, with the wings taken off, it was flown out on a C-124. Uh, later on, maybe 15 years ago, I can't remember how it occurred, but the, uh, the MiG-15 pilot, whose name was Lieutenant No Komsok, his American name was Ken, Ken Ro. And Ken Ro learned to speak English, got two degrees in engineering, electrical and uh, mechanical engineering, and worked in the aviation industry for many years, and then retired as a professor of aeronautical engineering from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in South Miami, Florida. And he and I are dear friends to this day, and we exchange emails daily. And I hope someday you will have him come here and talk, because he is an absolute uh, magnetic personality. Yeah, he's old. He's two years old, three years old, younger than me. But after his, after he gives a talk, people flock to the podium to talk to him. That, that's how powerful he is. Even my grandsons were attracted to him when they saw him speak one night. So, uh, uh, and I say that because Ken was unusual for. Some people say defector. He had planned his escape since age 13. He started off as a Navy cadet. And then, the, then he volunteered for pilot training because he thought he could escape in, a, in an airplane. And by golly, he did. His first flight after the war uh, in an, from an airfield just north of uh, Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. Uh, see if I have another one on there. Okay, that's the end of it. But anyway, that's the story of, of my year in Korea. It was uh, very, very interesting. 
and it, and it was quite frankly the best tour of my of my uh, Air Force 24 year Air Force career because I got to fulfill my teenage dream of being a fighter pilot and dog fighting. Vietnam was a different story. Thank you. Sir, I actually have uh, one comment. Uh, me being an aircraft mechanic and you being a pilot, sir, I just uh, appreciate the recognition uh, because it is cold weather. I've worked in 121 degree heat and as cold as eight degrees and it is hard work and we, uh, we appreciate what you pilots do and we keep doing it over and over and over again every day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm deaf. <laughs> can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, fine. I got a quick question for you. You threw, flew the thuds in Vietnam. I, I did, yes. Okay, I have, I have a good friend, a retired colonel, who flew 135 missions, wild weasel missions in Vietnam, and uh, I was just wondering if you met him, Colonel Jose Oliva. Uh, I okay, Here, here's what you might be interested in. He had somebody train him, which he in turn trained the rest of the pilots in his squadron, which resulted in no losses in the squadron when they were attacking SAM sites. There was some trick that they learned how timing-wise that they could get in and hit the SAM site and, and not get shot at down themselves. I don't remember the details, but I do remember that it was quite interesting to have him tell me about that. Okay, I'm very sorry. I couldn't understand uh, everything that you were saying. Uh, uh, there's an incompatibility between my hearing aids and the PA system, but you, he was talking about the wild weasels, right? A and uh, the wild weasels were after my time, the F-105 wild weasels. Uh, at the, during my time, uh, the F-100 wild weasels had just started, and I escorted the number two weasel uh, in the Hanoi area, and because the airplane was slower than the 105, they shot him down. Okay, thank you, John. That was a wonderful presentation. Our next speaker is a, an old friend, and I had the wonderful uh, opportunity to talk to his wife a few times, and she was, uh, my mother was a big band uh, person, as my aunt was. I owned a large music store in San Francisco, and. Uh, my mother won the dance contest in 1943 or 44 at Treasure Island. 3,000 sailors, soldiers, and Marines, and they were going to send her to Hollywood. And, but anyway, make a long story short, you know, we grew up in our house with the big band Sound, and his wife was uh, the famous singer Martha Tilton. And I used to talk with uh, Jim many years ago uh, through our mutual friend Ray Tolliver, and R Ray was a, a mentor of mine many years ago, and I was an aspiring historian and. I was reaching out to people and wanted to learn more about the Arrow Warriors, and this was a, a, a culture that I had grown up in. So we, we have a, 
a mutual tie there. And also is uh, Scott and Ann Woods here. Can you stand up, please? Okay. God bless you. Um, they put together a, a program several years ago, and I was honored to participate. And we did a little bit of shooting out at Ganoss Field when a P-51 February was on the rollout. And subsequent to that, his brother Chris and Scott and Ann, um, old friends with, with Jim, uh, put together a wonderful piece. It's called Gray Eagles. And if you ever have a chance, the opportunity to see it, it's really pretty special. And his grandson is here, James Brooks. James? Oh, okay, there he is. And, uh, you know, and his sister was in it. And, and it's some powerful, poignant moments. And as a documentary filmmaker myself, I really identified with it. It was, ex it was very well done. And I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Jim Brooks. Jim was a fighter pilot and he flew P-51s in World War II. And he was in the 15th Air Force, 35th, excuse me, 31st Fighter Group. And he'd shot down 13.5 airplanes. He flew many missions, some of the worst missions of World War II over Palestri. And that was a highly guarded target in Romania. And that's where Nazi Germany had all of their oil resources and their refineries. And that's also uh, a very crucial part of the history with the, the Air Warriors and the Air Force because there were five Medal of Honor recipients posthumously awarded for those raids on Palestri. And Jim used to lead those missions over there with the escort. And he was there on, on the tough times. And subsequent to that, he stayed in the Air Force. And when Korea broke out, he was on the front lines of freedom again. This time, again, the transition from props to jets, the F-86. And he also participated in the first uh, battle with all jets over the Yalu River, I guess 45 to 42,000 feet. And then later, when the American fighter races were formed in 1960, he was the first president. And that was how I eventually met uh, Jim through our good friend, Colonel Tolliver, great guy, wonderful mentor. And he's been very involved through the years of experimental test pilots. So again, these, the curriculum vitae with these gentlemen, I could go on and on. But let's get right to the source and let's, let's welcome Major James Brooks, US Air Force, retired. It's cold in here. Uh, 1949, excuse me, we deployed from Langley Air Force Base uh, to Korea in the F-86s. Uh, we went over an aircraft carrier. You <clears throat> have to pardon me, I've gotten a horse. But could I have a swig of this yeah. bourbon here? I like this fast and furious because I've heard so much of this going on here. I, all the guys are very much involved and all the stories are great. As I said, we deployed on an aircraft carrier to, uh, <clears throat> to Korea, or rather to uh, Japan, and then into Korea. And December 22nd, uh, 1950, uh, four of us went up to the Yalu. After we got the engine started, it was so cold we couldn't get the engines going. And uh, after getting four of them started, we went up. And at 42,000 feet, we were patrolling the yellow, and we could see San Anjou uh, down below, and then we could see dust coming off the airfield. Too high to see the airplanes, but we could see the dust. And uh, we had a flight leader, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Nance, who had a poverty of experience in World War II and also in the airplane, and uh, we had a very much of a disadvantage because we worked too high. The efficiency of the engine of the 86 was at its best 36,000. And uh, Nick Farrell, who was flying number four position, which is way out in the back, called aircraft at six o'clock, which is 
behind us, of course. And I looked back and I could see contrails coming from behind. And I hollered, break left, which we all did. The flight leader spun out. Uh, Bud Buck, who hadn't flown at Harley at all, uh, went straight down, and he was shot down, by the way, our first loss. <laughs> Nick Farrell and myself were against 12 MiGs. And at the time, we didn't know it, but there were 12 more there. So we managed to, to find our way out because, uh, as I said to Nick, I said, let's go get them. And he said, let's stay where we are. It's the only thing we've got going for us, which was altitude, of course. But that was the first big battle of the jet, the MiG-15s against the uh, F-86. And it's history to tell you, later on it was a five to one ratio uh, advantage over the MiGs. And the reason we had that advantage, we had what we call the radar range and gun sight. And we could uh, tell distance and uh, uh, we could tell, uh, well, what, what range it was, uh, which we didn't have in World War II, which gave us a great advantage. When I was in Russia a few years ago in Moscow, I went over to be decorated by the Russian Air Force and uh, at a cocktail party, uh, I engaged in conversation with a couple of MiG aces. I think one of them had it, eight, uh, 86s to his credit. And uh, he said, we couldn't figure out how you guys were shooting so many of us down until we captured an F-86 that Bud McEwen had crashed in a rice paddy in North Korea and got and captured one of the gun sites. And we figured out then that you had the best gun site. And of course, they never could equal that because the war was over um, before they could develop that. That was the only advantage we had. We, uh, we won the air war uh, in Korea, but we lost the ground war, and we haven't won one since. And, uh, but I like to go back a few years when I was president of the Society of Experiment and Test Pilots. Uh, we invited a test pilot from Messerschmitt, who was a test pilot during the war, who was a lady test pilot, by the way. Her name was Hannah Reich. And uh, I got to know her very well, and she was quite an interesting person. Uh, she was um, uh, very much involved in, in politics in Germany, and. Uh, she knew some stories about the Hitler and so forth, and it was quite interesting. I'll relate one of them to you. Uh, she was given an assignment to go in and bring Hitler and his wife out of Berlin before the Russians, Russians got there. And she flew in and landed on the Strauser, uh, you know. Well, it was a, st a Storch, a, a official Storch, what they called it. It was a Visto that she. You can land in, a, in this room, in fact. And she went into Hitler's headquarters, and uh, he, wouldn't, he didn't want to leave. He said, I'm going to stay here. And uh, of course he did. As you know, he committed suicide. And, but she said that what crushed her mostly was uh, there was uh, the propaganda minister, Gerbils, and his wife. And they had, I think, three young children. And she offered to take the children out, but they, they refused, and they all, of course, died there. And Hannah told me about, the, the, as being a test pilot, that was one of the interesting things she told me. Uh, the um, other story she told me about, she flew the first all-pure rocket airplane uh, for Messerschmitt. Schmidt. And there's film on this, by the way, you've probably have seen it. Shows it taking off and dropping the wheels. And, this, and I said, well, how was it? She said, well, she was just long for the ride. She just held on. And it went up to about 20, 30,000 feet, and then it flamed out. So then she had to court what we call dead sticking. Uh, with that uh, pow, she came across the aerodrome. She said, I don't know how fast I was going. But the, the film that I saw, she tumbles. Uh, the airplane just starts tumbling down the runway. It was a grass field. And she says, when I came to, I was upside down. My head was down in the cockpit, and my nose was gone. And she said, I looked around, and I found my nose and put it back on. <laughs> and she said, see the stitches? And you can see the little stitches that she, that she sewed, the, they sewed her nose back on. 
But the point I wanted to make to you was this. When she, she gave the speech that night, 1,500 people, and at the end of the speech she says, don't ever lose a war. And we haven't won one since World War II. So think about it. Thank you. Now, uh, questions? Okay, um, let's see, I was F-86 with the rocket, wasn't it? Uh, well, it was, you know, wasn't much to it, really. Uh, I stabilized out <coughs> at 42,000 feet, a Mark uh, 92 Mark number, lit the rocket, and uh, went up to 58,000 feet. It, I was just long for the ride, really. and. Uh, went straight up and came straight down, in fact. Uh, but um, the thing that impressed me most was, uh, it wasn't about the rocket, but I saw the curvature of the Earth for the first time. And uh, it's pretty exciting to see something like that. Some guys have done that before I, uh, Pete Everest, and I guess, Bob, Bob, you had been there before, had you? Yeah. You've been there, so. But, to see something like that, to be up there all by yourself, and all of a sudden you, you say, my God, I'm only one up here. <laughs> you look down, you see what Edwards Air Force Base looked like. It was about that long, you know. It was frightening, but it was exciting. Other questions? OK, I guess we know who's next. Is the building shaking? Well, this is kind of a, uh, a fun part for me because this is one of my good friends who I converse with all the time, as I do with, with all these guys. But he, General Titus is one of those special guys. And he's a friend. I'll tell you something. You got your back to the wall, and you're in that alley, and you got people that are on you and there's no place to go. You're in that tunnel and that train's bearing down on you. He's that guy you want next to you. That's the man who you want next to you. And he, and he was, he's been there for me. So, pretty special to me. Um, his career is quite unique because he served in three wars, number one. And he was a paratrooper in World War II. Nick? And uh, then he played football at uh, Virginia Tech. And then he decided, well, what the heck? The Air Force sounds like it might be fun. Let's go fly some airplanes for a while. By the way, his first airplane flight when he was five years old, sitting on his father's lap in a Waco. And as I told you earlier before, and I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of these guys, there's that inspiration, there's that light. Everybody has that light in their life, that enlightenment. What, what makes you want to get up in the morning? What makes you aspire? What makes you want to raise that bar? Well, aviation seems to have that enlightenment, that, that ability to make you push yourself to do better in school, go to college. You wanted to be a fighter pilot. Like Norm, when he was riding that horse in the Danville Valley as a little boy, he saw that biplane land and he wanted to fly airplanes. So that's what inspiration and enlightenment is all about. And in my opinion, uh, General Titus is one of those inspirational people, and I've known a lot of great ones, but this is a, a fine man. Um, in, in Korea, he flew P-51s. At that particular time, they called them F-51s. They were uh, troops in contact, flying low-level support, the, and the P-51 had a radiator, and you could hit it with a BB gun, and once that uh, glycol ran out, you were SOL, as Colonel Kraut knows, flying that twin Mustang. Well, he, he bails out of a flaming P-51, 
and he, he doesn't really know how low he was, but the chute popped, he's in enemy lines, and here's the, the allied lines, gets out, cr jumps in a, a shell hole, and he's being attacked by chai comms, and they're all coming at him with those Chinese drum-fed 50-round Tommy guns, and he's out there with a 45 ACP handheld Colt holding him off. Well, John Lowry to told me this story, and I've asked Earthquake about a lot of his stories. I've always, I've always bugged him about writing his book, and he's a pretty humble guy. And he said, no, he goes, I'd rather talk about other guys. Well, if you look at his curriculum vitae, you go, wow, three wars, test pilot, and so, and it's inspirational when you get a chance to be around people like that, because the great ones have the ability to defer. They know who they are, and they're more interested in you and, and seeing you go forward. Uh, he flew F-86s after, um, oh, by the way, that excerpt came from uh, Colonel David Hackworth and his book About Face. And he didn't know who it was, and then John Lowry put it together as a historian himself. And that was uh, General Titus shooting it out with a 45, with a, surrounded by JICOMs with machine guns, and he got out. And then he flew uh, F-86s, and he went into flight test. And he flew the 100 series and into Southeast Asia and uh, killed, shot down three MiGs, one with a gun, a gun pod, 20 millimeter gun pod, two with rockets. And I've interviewed him, and he, he could have took more MiGs. He could have shot down more MiGs, but his, he always had a young wingman. The wingman was in a jam. He pulled away. He had these guys dead to rights. He would have shot down five or six MiGs. What did he do? He looked out for that young pilot. Okay? So the other thing what I, I didn't tell you about, and I'll show some of you later at the Elks Club, he rode the Zero launch, and that was an F-100, and I'm not quite sure what the, that program was all about. He can tell you more. Probably if there was a nuclear war, they were going to deploy these uh, F-100s on trailers, and they'd, they'd raise them up, and they had a JTO rocket, off they'd go. And he, and he did that, as he did a lot of things in his career. But I look at him as a friend, as what he's done for me, and it's pretty special. So I'd like to be able to uh, take this opportunity to thank you for everything you've done for me. And here's Earthquake Titus. Well, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure for me to be in the presence of veterans and to observe the activity of this parade today. I'm, I'm simply overwhelmed with the opportunity to talk to so many great people. The motorcycle guys that escorted us up from the airport in San Francisco. Enough to bring tears to your eyes just to see the splendor of these guys and their loyalty and their patriotism. It's a humbling experience, always. I. Uh, here to talk about Korea, the Forgotten War. I was in New York on a cross country with my Mustang F-51, as they called it at the time. And uh, I spent the night in the city and woke up in the morning to see that we were at war again. It was in June of uh, 1950. So I flew back to my base and immediately went to personnel and said, uh, I volunteer. And they said, we don't need to, you to do that. Uh, they're not asking for any people. They've got all they need over there. Well, I kept pestering the personnel people, but it took about a year before I finally got orders to go to uh, Luke Air Force Base and do some gunnery on the way to uh, Korea. And uh, the only other guys there <coughs> in my group uh, shooting gunnery were recalled guard guys. Everybody was from the National Guard, from various uh, states around the country. And they were all highly experienced, uh, high-time uh, Mustang pilots. So uh, I made some good friends and learned a lot more about flying than I knew previously, because these guys had a lot to teach. And I had never really been associated with uh, combat veterans like these guys. So uh, I enhanced my skills, as it were, and uh, went to Japan to the processing center 
and they told me I was going to be resigned to uh, Johnson Air Base in Japan. I said, wait a minute, I've been waiting for a year to get into this war, and now you're not going to let me go again. Well, I took the assignment in good faith and did my best to stay current and enhance my shooting skills. And I had some friends in Korea who would, uh, in the 18th fighter wing, and they went to the group commander and said, we got a guy in Japan who wants to be in the war, and most of the other guys here didn't want to be in the war. They were happy to think about getting 100 missions if they could survive them and go home. Well, finally, uh, I got called in by the group commander, a colonel, who proceeded to chew me out and tell me that I had no business uh, trying to arrange my own assignments. And after dressing me down and putting me in my place, he said, however, I found out you've got the group gunnery records, so I'm going to let you go. Well, it was an interesting time because uh, in my fighter group, which was the 35th fighter group at Johnson Air Base in Japan, we were equipped with a squadron of Mustangs, a squadron of P-80s, and a squadron of F-94A interceptors. And one day, two other pilots and I were sitting and having lunch at the Oak Club, and then walked the group commander and asked to join us, and yes, sir, please, have a seat. And he said, I need pilots for the F-94 squadron. One guy said, I'd like to do that, sir. Colonel said, you got any jet time? Yes, sir, I've got 15 hours. Well, fine, you're good, we'll put you in the squadron. The other guy said, I've got nine hours, sir, could I go? He said, sure, yeah, we'll put you in that squadron. I said, I'd like to fly jets, Colonel. He said, you got any jet time, Titus? I said, no, sir. I got a lot of Mustang time, B-26 time, C-45 time, I got a lot of other time. All props, he says. I said, yeah, all props. No, 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 you can't go. I said, why, are you going to tell me, Colonel, that it's harder to fly a, a jet than it is a Mustang? He said, you have to understand, it's an entirely different concept. <laughs> I not what the hell he was talking about. Well, anyway, later on we ran out of Mustangs. They gave us F-86s. The story is, okay, now, <clears throat> if you can't get current in this thing in 10 hours, we're going to get rid of you. So I got a couple of rides in the F-86. First ride, I went up and flew it around a little bit and came back and landed. And I said, they've been lying to me. This thing's a kiddie car. How can you get hurt in an airplane like this? It was the easiest thing I ever flew to land. Anyway, that's how it was. I got my ride. In, uh, I didn't get 10 hours before I was flying number four in a flight. And we were going north. I said, I must be checked out. We crossed the Alder River, and turned around and came back, and I saw some airplane out in front pull up, and I thought, nobody said anything. I don't know what that is. I counted one, two, three, four, five. No, I'm four. Three, two, one. That's a MiG up in front. <laughs> Flight lead didn't say anything. His radio had failed. An interesting uh, experience. I said, if he'd only called me, told me, I could have gotten high and might have got that mink. But that wasn't the day for minks. But uh, flying Mustangs in combat in Korea was an interesting experience because mostly we were doing interdiction, stopping the flow of uh, trucks and whatever going south, carrying ammo and ammunition, uh, that is, and fuel, uh, and doing a lot of close support. We had a song. Close support's a damn fine mission because you work so close to the troops. But the 40s and 50s will get you in the cool and then she'll cough and then she'll turn around and poop. So you bail out, right out while your buddies circle around you and the commies blaze away. Registration boys will get you someday. So we lost a lot of airplanes. Uh, but as I say, being an ex-infantryman, I was dedicated to close support. I, I, I just felt that that's what I was trained to do, and that's what I should be doing. And, uh, you know, so you get your airplane shot up a lot doing that. And if you're lucky, you don't get one in the coolant or one in the cockpit. I came home one day with blood on my handkerchief uh, wrapped around my arm, and the debriefing officer says, what's that? What, what happened? I said, I got a nick. What do you mean you got a nick? I said, well, a piece of flak or something came through the side of the cockpit and nicked me in the arm. He said, well, you got a Purple Heart. And I said, no, Purple Hearts are for the troops up on the front line who get themselves posthumously 
decorate it with a purple heart. That's not deserving of a purple heart. Well, you know, we're veterans. A lot of my friends never got to be veterans. We lost 15 pilots out of 25 in one month. So I was convinced I wasn't going to make it, simply because the odds were against me. I remember calling a friend of mine in Japan and told him I was coming over in an R&R &R and uh, maybe we could get together. And this was a guy I'd gone to high school with and college with. And uh, he said, uh, I asked him if, if he'd do some things for me. He knew my mother and I told him what I wanted him to do with my stuff. And he said, my God, why are you telling me this? And I said, because the odds of me getting out of this are somewhere between zip and zilch. He said, well, I don't want to hear you talk like that. <laughs> well, what kind of a friend are you? But it was, it was a, a presumption of the possibility that you weren't going to make it. But you couldn't let that bother you because your commission gave you the opportunity to raise your right hand and say, I will. And we did, regardless of the outcome. I mean, that's what it's all about, isn't it? People used to say to me, why aren't you afraid of getting killed? And I said, no, why should I be afraid of getting killed? We all die sometime, don't we? So what's the point in being worried? Don't die all tensed up, I used to say to my guys. <laughs> but it was, a brilliant, it was a brilliant experience, you know. I, I, I had a tough time getting into Korea, as I indicated. And then uh, it was the same thing in trying to get into Vietnam. They always said, you know, you're too essential in your job. And I'm saying, what's more essential than flying combat? So I was fortunate enough to fly some 550 combat missions in a variety of airplanes over uh, a number of occasions. And uh, I guess I would have tried to stay and fly some more. But they finally sent me home. I remember coming out of Vietnam, I uh, told General Graham, who was the vice commander of 7th Air Force, and I'd worked for him a couple of times, and I said, uh, I want to extend again. And he said, no, no, you've already done enough. And I said, well, I'm going to ask General Momeyer when I go in to talk to him. And he said, he'll throw you out of, your, as, out of his office. And after a while, I saw General Graham again. He said, what happened? I said, you called it. <laughs> he said, get out of here. Now, here's a beautiful lady down here by the name of Christina Olds. Her father and I were great friends. General Robin Olds, fighter ace in World War II and, uh, and a great combat leader in Vietnam. And uh, he had the same problem, trying to get to Korea. He was too important to go to Korea. Uh, he understood that that was false, but it didn't matter. Uh, sometimes you get to play in the ball game and sometimes you don't. But it's been a privilege to serve my country. And uh, I'm only sorry that I can't do it again. Thank you. Um, I might have failed to mention that he's been awarded the Air Force Cross and several silver stars. So that's some powerful stuff. Um, again, as I told you, you know. These men up here are humble men. These are these are warriors, and you know sometimes you got to pull the stories out of them. And uh, so, please step up. General Titus has a lot more stories he can tell you. If you have some questions, here we go. Hi, uh, I had a question. My friend's grandfather was uh, a Sabre pilot in North Korea. Um, he, or not, not, sorry, in South Korea. And um, he, his name was Robert S. Toby. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the name. Uh, Toby. Yeah, T-O-B-Y. Oh, okay. He he uh, he was a Top Gun uh, graduate. He he went through the Top Gun school, and he got oh he got the Top Gun uh, 
I forget. He he just passed away last year though, but uh, he 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 uh, shot down. I think it was two MIGs. Um, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for stepping up. It's nice to see young people who have an interest to learn about history. And you keep pressing on. Good for you. Um, Colonel Kraut, this is an F-82 pilot. Gentlemen, thanks very much for your stories, but you've all been in Korea, and I'm looking to find anyone that knew Harry uh, Thing in Korea, Harrison R. Thing. He was a group commander. <clears throat> Harrison R. Thing. Harry was a ace. Now I want, I want you to tell me the truth about why in the hell he came back to Hamilton and insisted that I write a requirement for a lightweight fighter. He said he needed to shave uh, pounds off that damn 86 so he could shoot down more MiGs. And I'm the one that wrote the requirements for the lightweight fighter that became the F-104. But I'd like, your, I'd like to hear from you what in the hell caused him to have to have a lightweight fighter. I was at North American Aviation at that time, and we designed what they call a lightweight fighter. And uh, the Air Force, there was a requirement for it. Uh, I can't tell you what it was, but uh, it didn't get very far because our design was putting the scoop underneath the airplane. And the Air Force said, no, that won't work because if you have to land wheels up, it'll destroy the whole airplane. The scoop will take care of everything. So that was whitewashed. Well, so, I worked for Harry for quite a while. And he insisted that he would have had uh, 10 more kills if he'd have had a lightweight fighter. So he knew that I'd written the requirements for the uh, first generation of all weather fighters. And I put together a, what I was happy with as a requirement for a lightweight fighter. I took it into him to have him review it before I took it across to the general. And he says, Kraut, have you taken every ounce of weight out? I said, general, uh, Colonel, that's not my job. That's uh, for the engineers. He says, uh, does it have a relief tube in it? I said, Colonel, that is not up to me. He says, take that back in there and write that it will not have a relief tube in that fighter. And that's why you people have had to wear piddle packs ever since. Thank you. Is there anybody out here who wants to ask anything from, about a paratrooper? Nick? Nick Provenzano. By the way, editor for an airman story and some of the work that some of you have seen, we collaborated together and, and uh, Nick also did a lot of the editing on the, the shorts on your story from your interview. And, here, and Nick's a dedicated historian and, and reenactor of the 506 Easy Company, paratroopers. So that's a question for you. Well, I, Leon kind of put me on the spot here a little bit because I've just, just been uh, enamored by your, by your stories with the Air Force and so forth. And I, first of all, I just want to say thank you to, to all of you up here on stage and uh, to the men and women in the audience who served. Um, obviously, today is a day where we set aside to thank you, but... Um, my family and I thank you the other 364 days of the year as well, and, uh, and I'll be out there also. Um, I, I kind of just had a general question um, in that, you know, so many of you started in, in uh, the prop era and transitioned into the jet era, and as things became more automated, as, as a pilot, did you see that as, as an advantage or a disadvantage to you personally because as things became more automated, did it make things easier for you, or did you feel that it sort of disconnected you more from uh, a more intimate relationship with your with your uh, your airplane? 
uh, automation of the, of the systems versus flying, you know, the early F-86 or P-51 as the aircraft became more advanced? Well, certainly the aircraft are phenomenally more uh, I was out at uh, Mountain Home a year ago, and uh, the squadron I commanded in Vietnam at Da Nang is now a uh, 389th Fighter Squadron is at Mountain Home. And while there, my wife and I each got a, an opportunity to get into the uh, F-15 simulator. And I'll tell you what, there's so much happening in that cockpit that it, uh, I, can, I can see why it takes them six months to teach somebody to fly it. You've got all kinds of heads-up displays, and they had a new flying helmet that they showed me that was so exotic that I couldn't even begin to comprehend it, but it cost $100,000. And I'm saying, this is getting too exalted. The airplanes they're designing today, like the F-22 and the F-35, cost about $400 million a copy, and they can do all kinds of things. And I'm saying, but how does that help you kill terrorists? You know, we're, we're designing ourselves beyond the capability to afford anything. What we need are some more lightweight fighters. <laughs> okay, any other? We have a question here. For all four of you gentlemen, uh, my uncle, Sherwood Jensen, flew F-86s in Korea and then went to Taiwan to train the Taiwanese to fly the Sabre jet. I was wondering if any of you knew him. Jensen was his name? Yeah, Jensen. Jensen? Yes, sir. First name? Uh, Sherwood. Well, thank you, anyway. I'd like to ask the entire panel what the top five characteristics of a good fighter pilot are. <laughs> Norm? <laughs> uh, top uh, five characteristics. Probably the first one would be not too smart. Uh, second one would be you would have to have a strong will, as you heard from all four of us. Uh, you don't quit easily or early. And in three of our cases, we all played football in college. And uh, college football teaches you an awful lot if you survive. And uh, I was a running back, and when a 180-pound guy is taught to run through a hole that's supposed to be made by to 240 pound guys. If they make the hole, you go a ways. If they don't make the hole, you get trashed right there. Uh, you build up your confidence. So confidence, uh, that's three. I'll pass this on for the remaining two. I've always said give a high school graduate a big engine and six guns and he'll kill somebody. Well, I've always believed that uh, fighter pilots are born, not made. You can, uh, you can find people who are flying fighters who are not fighter pilots. They want to, the, the real fighter pilots are, are dedicated to engaging the enemy. Uh, good vision helps. <laughs> yes, I, I, I have several ways I can answer that. I'll try to be serious. <laughs> Uh, I would say basically the type A personality uh, is, the, is the personality that usually is, in my experience, was selected out of flight school uh, for fighters. And uh, uh, they're garrulous, libidinous, and all kinds of things. 
I'll point out another thing. Uh, when I was at Edwards, uh, the fighter guys uh, used to tell the bomber pilots and the cargo pilots that the difference between them and us was that they had a deep-seated interest in aviation, but predominantly a fear of flying. <laughs> Okay, well, let's let's heat this up a little more. I like the, the where, where this is going. We have some more questions back there. General Titus, I, I'd like to know how you got out of that uh, predicament with only a 45. Well, I, I actually uh, by cowering in the hole. <laughs> Because when I saw the guys in the quilted pajamas coming toward me, I took a couple of pot shots and they responded with something that sounded like Rrr! And I thought, well, I'm probably outgunned. But uh, I didn't know what was going to happen until I heard a friendly voice, an American voice say, keep your head down and crawl this way. The Marines sent out a patrol and uh, laid down covering fire and I crawled on my belly to the bunker. Hey. Awesome. Gentlemen, in as much as everybody here seems to think that we had 12 pilots in any of those wars, I'm going to also ask you, do you know Johnny Zeke Zarlingo? I do. Thank you. Yeah, I guess my question would be to each and every one of you. Uh, what is your overall rating of the North Korean pilot and the MiG-15 against the F-86? One part to answer the question is, I wouldn't say American pilots were any better than Russian pilots, and the reason we are better is because the hours of training. A good fighter pilot has to fly about 30 hours a month. They're cutting it back now in the Air Force to about 20, and they're giving them time in the simulator. Simulator doesn't count. Only airplane counts. And when we were in Vietnam, we had pilots with many, many hours, and they all came highly trained. And they fought against Russian pilots that were good Vietnamese, but they didn't have the number of hours. And you can't take a 100-hour pilot and put him against a 1,000-hour pilot and expect him to break even. I agree. That's good. We learned a lot about who was flying the MiGs when uh, my good friend Ken Rowe defected from the North Korean Air Force. But um, you always, always knew when you were uh, uh, fighting a Russian because the Russians would dogfight. But the, the uh, Chinese and the North Korean Air Force was, were newly consti uh, constituted and uh, they were student pilots. Ken Rowe, when he landed at Kempo, had 185 total flying hours, 55 of which were combat missions, uh, and uh, shooting Chinese and Korean mix was, as an old man, I will say pitiful, because they didn't know what to do. But with a Russian, you knew what you were up against. And, and by the way, to this day, I pride myself in that the first time I was ever shot at was by a Russian, and it was at very high altitude, and, uh, 
and I managed to shake him. And you say, well, how do you know he was Russian? And there were two ways based on what Ken Rowe told us later. And number one, he wanted to fight. Number two, uh, he had a copper colored MIG. It was painted copper on the top, co copper brown, and mottled gray on the belly. Uh, my first vision of it was 12 foot of flames coming out the nose from his 30, 37 millimeter cannon. Uh, yeah, that was pertaining to the last question about uh, how did you know they were Russian pilots uh, at that time? Or did it, was it after the war you found out? If I, if I understood the question, uh, uh, we knew they, we now know that they were Russian pilots if they wanted to fight, uh, if they would stay with you and, and, and play the game as it were. Uh, the uh, Koreans would try to climb to altitude and get back into Chinese airspace which had been uh, uh, protected airspace until uh, General Barkas took command in uh, March or April of 52, and he said, to hell with the Yalu River. And so we were regularly in China. Out of 45 missions that I flew, 30 of them were in China. Okay. But uh, uh, I, to, to answer your question, the, the Russians would fight with you, but the Chinese and and uh, North Koreans. By the way, the Chinese had beautiful sky blue MiGs, and, and uh, on the belly of the airplane, their airplanes were painted a, uh, a mottled gray. And, and honestly and truly, the first time I ever saw one was 12 foot of flames I saw first. Then I saw the airplane because the camouflage was so good. Of course, we're at high altitude. And I got one last question as for General Titus. May I, may I add something here? We knew they were Russian pilots because we had a, a, a cement building in the middle of Johnson Field. <clears throat> Through radio networks, we were intercepting languages from North Korea, and they were all in Russian. And that was 1950. So we knew who in the hell were flying those airplanes. We couldn't tell anybody. No, no we couldn't tell anybody. I would like to add that Ken Rowe says, he says this in his book, A MiG-15 to Freedom, which is really a good book. He says that there were three Russian air divisions in uh, China, and there were 400 pilots, and they lost, they lost 800 airplanes. Uh, yeah, General Titus, um, I just wanted to ask one thing about the F-100. Uh, did you ever get any uh, close calls in that plane, you know, like the Sabre dance? The F-100? Yeah, that um, flight envelope where they called the Sabre dance. Nothing that I can remember. <laughs> calls are like anything else. That's history. Uh, I, 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 I'm amused. Uh, I, I was flying a, a chase. Actually, this was in an F-104, and uh, Chance Vaught had a, an airplane that was in competition with a Phantom because an F-8U-3P. And uh, uh, the company test pilot I needed to get a supersonic point, test point. And I had uh, what was called a pacer. It was a calibrated F-104. And I moved out so that the shock, uh, shock waves wouldn't interact. And something went between us heading the other way. <laughs> uh, and he said, what was that? And I said, I think it might have been a 102. I could see the black smoke uh, from George Air Force Base. and. Uh, when we landed, well, we went back and got on speed again and got the point. And when we landed, the safety officer came out and said, my 
God, my God, he said, I thought there was a mid-air collision, you know. Boy, you're so lucky, it's close. He was more scared than I was. I said, that's history. Nothing happened. <laughs> so there have been a few experiences like that that I'm sure we've all enjoyed. <laughs> How about Tom back there? Yeah, you. You're an Air Force brat. I would like to ask each and every one of us, if you don't do life, there's something that always sticks in your mind. What would that be? There's one, there's, there's one, one episode that always sticks in your mind throughout your whole career, what would it be? Just trying to survive. I used to pray on the way to a combat mission. Not for survival, but I asked God to let me do my mission. Don't let me fail. I would think, say the, the thing that sticks in my mind most is my uh, tour as a student and my three tours as an instructor or later maintenance test pilot at Nellis Air Force Base when we had an uncommon number of fatal accidents. Um, almost every time I would walk out of a building, there'd be a big column of black smoke off the end of the runway because somebody uh, flew their traffic pattern too tight. Uh, and to this day, when I see a black column of smoke, it still twangs my memory. Well, gentlemen, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for serving this country. And I very, very well appreciate it, and so does my son. Thank you. <laughs>